So it, it is a pleasure. Uh, I told Tony this when, when Tony responded to my invitation positively, he made my day, probably my week. Uh, I've known Tony for a long time through a couple different associations. I've had great respect, respect for his work. Uh, Tony's an international scholar and researcher in online and distance education. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you the number of countries. I'm not sure if Tony could tell you the number of countries he's visited in one capacity or, or the other. Uh, he spent a first part of his career was actually at the Open University of uh, the UK. Uh, he told us over lunchtime he was his uh, I employee number was 00020. He was the 20th employee of the Open UK, which is really pretty cool to be there on the ground floor. He was also for quite a while with uh, UBC, the University of British Columbia, as a faculty member in media studies. Uh, Tony's looked at this intersection of technology and education for all of his career, has written on that intersection, and today will be sharing with us his lens of, uh, of this continuation of how technology is transforming and influencing higher education. So it's a pleasure to introduce Tony Bates. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, everybody. Now, I have to tell you, the last time I was in Pennsylvania was in November on election day and the day after. And I gave a keynote at Drexel to a faculty and staff completely in shock. Now, if anything like that happens today when I go back, this is the last time I'm coming to Pennsylvania. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's talk about developments in digital learning. I'm going to do this two ways. I'm going to do it uh, vertically and horizontally. Uh, vertically being historically and horizontally being geographically. Oops. So what I'm going to do is talk first of all about how we got to where we are today. And I'm going to do that for a very good reason. Um, digital learning did not appear out of nowhere. It's got a long history leading up to it, and we often forget the history, and as a result, we forget the lessons from that history. So we tend to reinvent history with every time a new development comes along in technology. I want to say something fairly briefly about digital learning today. A lot of people in the audience were probably as much, or if not more, ahead of this than I am. But then I want to talk on the international scale, and particularly about educational technology transfer in developing countries. Because I would say that in 90% of cases, it's failed. And I want to look at the 10% of cases where it succeeded, and the reasons for that. Because we hear arguments now that MOOCs are going to change the developing world. Students won't need teachers anymore. Uh, they can get it all from Harvard and MIT and so on. And it's a whole lot of nonsense about that. And I want to go through the reasons for that. And I want to end up lessons learned, not just from developing countries, but for us today in how we're going to deal with digital learning. So how did we get there? Okay, well, we started with Moses. <laughs> And the tablets of stone, the first educational technology, right? What a great way to get the idea of Ten Commandments over. God gave me these stones with the commandments on them. So, yes, Moses knew how to use technology. St. Paul's Epistles to the Corinthians is a form of distance education, of course. And Socrates was running tutorials, sitting under the linden tree with a group of students around him, 400 B.C., the lecture theater, you see, uh, that's from the, uh, you've probably seen that famous one of Henry IV uh, lecturing uh, from the 13th century. Um, and it has all the things of a modern lecture, like people going to sleep in the back, a uh, guy chatting up a, a, a woman in the corner there. Um, so, you know, that goes back a long way. But the thing that really changed university education was the printed book. And the Chinese invented printing in the 7th century. We tend to forget that. But it was the invention of the uh, printing press in the 15th century that changed things. And there's a good reason for that, because it allowed knowledge to be recorded um, and, uh, what's the word I want, uh, challenged and uh, gone over and transmitted and expanded to large numbers. That was the whole point of printing. Um, 
In 1858, the University of London offered a fully distant degree by correspondence, mainly for people living in the British Commonwealth uh, who could never get to Britain. And what it was basically was a reading list. And they then did a supervised exam in their own country. And if they passed, they got a degree from the University of London. Didn't have a very high completion rate, incidentally, about 1%. But Radio farm forums, when radio came along, uh, in Canada, a lot of farms were isolated, um, and they ran these very successful radio farm forums based on three principles, listen, discuss, act, which is great kind of adult education uh, mantra. Um, television came along, Chicago TV College. Some of you may remember the New York University Sunrise Semesters, the first form of MOOC. Um, uh, the best professors uh, lecture at 6 o'clock in the morning if you wanted to get up and watch it, and Sixth Street, of course. And as a result, we got uh, schools television projects, um, mainly through USAID or through uh, UNESCO in Ivory Coast, uh, Mexico, Radio uh, Primaria, and uh, Television Secundaria, in Brazil, uh, ETV Maranhão, and in American Samoa. And these were evaluated very carefully by a team from Stanford, M. McAnally and others. Um, and these largely were unsuccessful. And I'll come back to the reasons for that later. And in the US, we moved on to satellite. There was the Appalachian Educational Satellite Project for training teachers in, in Tennessee and uh, neighboring uh, states. And in India, satellite, uh, they, they ran a satellite program for rural areas uh, early as 1975, in 1983 they built their own satellite and launched it, and that program is still running. <clears throat> now we look at the development of digital technologies. Um, well, first of all, Skinner's teaching machine, and can, can we have the video for that? This is an amazing YouTube video. Arithmetic, or algebra, or grammar, or in fact anything involving the use of words or symbols. Each student is using a teaching machine, a device which creates vastly improved conditions for effective study. What are teaching machines? How are they used? What can they teach? Okay, then Plato came along. How many people know about Plato? Yeah. It was an amazing success. It went for, for many, many years. It was a kind of computer-assisted learning. It was used particularly in, in uh, training. Um, that's a Boeing plant there where Plato was used for training Boeing, by Boeing engineers and so on. It was basically a massive mainframe computer with lots of uh, terminals. It wasn't the internet. It, it just ran over uh, private networks. Then the internet and microcomputers came in in 1980. World Wide Web in 1990, it's 27 years. Now, that may seem a long time to all you young people here, but for me, that's just a blink of an eyelid. That it was tr Only 27 years ago, we had the World Wide Web. The first fully online university was launched in 1995, and I'm going to let you think about which which university that was and where it was, because I think you're going to be surprised when I tell you later on. And learning management systems came in 1995. I was working at UBC at the time, and we had a very bright young faculty member called Murray Goldberg who decided to put a web-based um, learning management system up, basically, and became WebCT, which was then sold to Blackboard, eventually. Um, but it started at UBC. So where are we today? Well, what are the main technologies being used? You're probably all fami been familiar with this bit. Learning management systems, still very prevalent. We're just doing a survey at the moment. We're finding that 95%, even today, uh, most online courses have the use of a learning management system in them. Uh, webcasting and web conferencing, video streaming, open digital textbooks, and mobile phones and tablets. And what we've seen is an amazing growth in online learning. You probably all know these figures from the Babson surveys. Um, 
But basically, online enrollment, enrollments have been growing five times faster than on-campus enrollments. Um, that's beginning to ease off, slow down slightly, but it's still increasing. It's not that it's not increasing, it's just not increasing at such a fast rate. Although I suspect at some point, and I suspect we're almost at there now, as uh, flexible learning um, on campus becomes more prevalent, we'll probably see a little easing off of the fully online programs. But, but the thing I want to point out about, these are full credit courses, which were started back before fall 2002. We were offering full credit courses in 1997. Uh, at UBC, but um, there weren't many then. But what I want to point out, in Canada, at any rate, I'm not sure about the US, I think it's more variable, we're getting very high completion rates from our credit-based online courses. They're about 5 to 10% below the classroom courses. And you'd expect that, because many of these students are working, uh, trying to fit their studies on top of, they're not full-time students. But the big thing that's happening now, certainly in Canada, is blended and hybrid learning. And I, I, I have a def definition. So for me, blended learning is you still have your regular lectures, but you add online learning on top. So you're adding more work for the students, usually. But it's where you reduce, but don't eliminate your face-to-face -face teaching in order to give students more time to study online. And this has been a big move in Canada, certainly. And my estimate is that if we go on at the current rate, at least half of all classes everywhere in North America will be hybrid in some form. Um, the design at the moment tends to be one of the most prominent designs is flipped. In other words, you record the lecture, the students watches the lecture at home, and they come into class. There are all kinds of problems with that that I won't go into, like the students don't watch the lecture before they come into class. But, <coughs> but what... That's the, obviously, what people do is they take technology and they do what they did before, but using the technology. Then they begin to use the technology and realize they need to do things a bit differently and they can get better results if they, and that's beginning to, to happen now. Uh, I have a nice project where I go around and interview faculty using technology for teaching called Pockets of Innovation. And I see a, a lot of redesign happening as a result. Now, you all know about MOOCs driven by Stanford, Harvard, and MIT. There have been attempts at accreditation, but assessment is a massive challenge when you've got a very large numbers. It's on the bottom slide there, at Purdue, I think it was. They ignored any part of research from credit online courses. MIT and Stanford were trying to rebrand online learning in their own name as if it never existed before. Um, and it's still difficult. The only people making money out of this are Coursera, not the universities. Um, but nevertheless, it, it's useful. It's very useful for non, uh, for non credit continuing education. It's a great way to let people know what your professors are doing and get, getting, uh, get the name of your institution out. In, interestingly, there are more MOOCs in, the, in Europe than there are in the US. And Europe is about, was about two years behind the US in, in picking up MOOCs. And I think what we're seeing is moves beginning to decline in, in the US, but they're still going up in, in, in Europe. The other big development for me is open publishing. Um, free online open textbooks. In my province, British Columbia, the government has put money into providing all first and second year university and college courses. To, they will have an open textbook, which is free to students. These textbooks are selected and uh, reviewed by faculty so to make sure that they're, they're quality standards. And they, We have 21 out of 23, 21 out of 25 higher education institutions now using open textbooks. Um, we've saved stu students $2 million so far. We're a small province, 3 million people, and we saved $2 million so far um, through the open textbook project. And big savings are still down the road because we've still got new, 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 new books coming through which haven't been adopted yet but will be soon. I've done a book called Teaching in a Digital Age, which I did as an open, uh, free textbook. Uh, it's been downloaded 50,000 times so far and voluntarily translated into 10 different languages. 
Um, that's one of the great things about when you publish something that's open, somebody else can take it and they can adapt it and use it however they like. I don't, I don't um, what's the word, I don't supervise the quality of the translations. If I look at a Portuguese translation, I wouldn't know whether it's good or bad. The issue is if somebody doesn't like that translation, somebody else can do a translation and so on. Um, in fact, I think it's open education that is really going to change everything in universities. We've got open textbooks. We're getting increasingly open research now. In other words, if you get a federal grant, either in the US or in Canada, you have to publish in an open journal. Um, now, there's all kind of games being played by the publishers around this, but nevertheless, what it means is that all publicly funded research is now openly accessible to students. Um, open education resources, um, which materials created and freely available, not just textbooks, but uh, modules of assessment and so on. And the important implication of this is that all content soon will be free, abundant, and online. Now, the thing about universities is they've, mon they've had a monopoly on advanced knowledge. They've, they've had that within their walls, within their libraries, and so on, within the faculty's head. Now, if the students can get the knowledge outside, what is the role of the faculty member? And I'll come back to that a little bit later. But what it re means to me is that teaching and learning, and, or teaching and learning support, becomes much more important than content delivery. So I think this is going to be, in the long run, the real game changer. Uh, when I gave this presentation at Berkeley, I had a huge argument there with, with the faculty. And they said, it's impossible. You, you, know, you, you can't give the knowledge that I have out to everybody else and so on. I said, well, MIT's doing it. Stanford's, you know, Stanford's doing it. It's not going to be long before Berkeley is doing it as well. <clears throat> the other big development is use of multimedia in teaching. Um, we've always had educational television and radio and so on, but we've got a lot more now. And th the importance of this is that print and talk, historically, have been dominant in university teaching for very good reasons. Uh, you can capture abstract thought through text. Um, it's linear. You can make a continuous argument and so on is many benefits of text and print. And that's not going to go away. But you could also now represent knowledge through many different other media. Um, audio, video, computing, virtual reality. And there's a lot of research to show that if you present knowledge in multiple media formats to students, they get a much deeper understanding of what you're talking about. Because they can see it in different aspects. And I'll give you one example. Some of the first research I did at the Open University was on their math programs. And the BBC was making very nice animations of mathematical equations. And we did research on that. And what we found was that the A students didn't need it. They could think abstractly anyway. And the D and E students, they were lost totally. But the C students did a lot better. They moved them from being a marginal fail to success because that extra understanding of what the mathematics was doing was critical for them to be able to handle the abstractions. We had a huge debate in the math faculty about whether that, if a student understood it in a, in a, in a, um, a virtual way, did it actually count if they couldn't do the actual mathematic uh, um, formulae and so on. So there was an interesting argument amongst the mathematicians about that. Now, the, one of the things that we also found from the research is the importance of recording, the ability to stop, start, and repeat something. So most MOOCs are not watched live. They're, people re download, record them, and then they play them bit by bit, and so they can work at their own pace. We found that, actually, when we compared radio with audio cassettes at the Open University. Same program on an audio cassette, but the students could stop and start it. So what we started doing then is designing the audio cassettes different so the students had to stop it and do an activity and come back again. And that allows learners to work at their own pace. And also, particularly with video and audio, it allows you to move from the concrete to the abstract and back again, which again is a very important uh, in 
academic um, knowledge. And also, it can meet individual preferences for learning. Some people would rather watch something than listen to it, and so on. And now we've got some more technologies coming through, virtual and augmented reality, learning analytics, open education resources, and AI-based adaptive and personal learning. So that's where we got to. Now I'm going to switch from the vertical to the horizontal and look at uh, digital learning in developing countries. That map is a map of uh, internet density in different countries around the world. So you can see China is huge. Um, North America is huge, Alaska is huge, uh, but there's not a lot going on in Africa um, and not a lot going on in, in some parts of Latin America in terms of internet uh, access and so on. Now, I'm going to give four examples of where technology was successfully transferred. I'm going to start with this one. This is very personal. I took this photograph just outside where the Bamian statues, the Buddha statues were, uh, before the Taliban blew them up. And we were there looking at a UNESCO project to put in educational radio and television into Afghanistan in 1974. And these Kuchis, this is a nomadic tribe going through here. And our task was to get primary health education, particularly for women, like birth control, etc., out to people who access to other forms of education. So we saw these kuchis going by, and I haven't got a photograph, unfortunately, but one of them had a boom box. So we got our translators to talk to them, and we said, well, what do you use your boom box for? And they said, well, we play Afghan pop music. And where do you get the Afghan pop music? Well, we go into the markets, and they sell these audio cassettes. So what we did, we went to we got the, the most popular pop singer of the day in Afghanistan, don't ask me his name, I've forgotten, and said, look, next time you make a record, could we insert one-minute health messages between your numbers? He said, yeah, that's a great idea. So that's what we did, and then the Kuchis ended up, we, there was a follow-up, and yes, they were listening to these health messages and so on. So, now, I give that example because it's a very low-tech solution, but... It was adapted to the local circumstances and it worked for that particular audience. A more modern one is the University of North Carolina's um, Wider Net and eGranary project. How many of you know about this one? Uh, this is a very interesting project. Many places in Africa, they, by the, if they've got internet access, it's really expensive. Um, so what they did was build local area networks. So for a, for a modest-sized town, they would go in and put in a server, and they would look at the best way to link terminals around in the schools and the university, with probably schools and colleges, there wouldn't be universities in these towns. And then what they did, they did a dump into the server from the internet in the US of all the primary content that these students would need in the schools. And so they use this local area network, which is very, very cheap. It doesn't cost them anything to log on and so on. And you see it started as one, one project, and which we're all talking about pilots in this morning, you know, and it, you can see where it's used around, around uh, Africa and Asia. And that's been very successful. Another project that's been very successful is not the MIT MOOCs, but MIT Blossoms. Do you know about this program? No, this is a fascinating program. This is math and science video for high schools in developing countries. But the way it works is that MIT goes to the country, gets teachers from the country to make the videos. They get them to script it. They, they, they help them with this. They bring cameramen out and, they, and so on. But they teach them locally how to make these videos. And then they bring the videos back and share them over the internet with anybody who wants to use them. And they have a big selection now. This one is um, how mosquitoes fly in the rain. Why don't why it rains? Why doesn't it crush them? You know. Um, and again, it, it professor, but there are what, lots of made by by Indian and Sri Lankans and so on. And this one is called iCow. It's a local mobile app for breeding cycles in Kenya. So when a cow gets into gestation and so on. There's all kinds of things you have to do as a farmer. So they download this app 
and the a actually is time related. So they put in the date of the gestation period, and then it gets them, gives them prompts what to do, you know, as the cow goes through the gestation and so on. This was developed locally in Kenya by Kenyan app developers. Right? And the last one I want to talk about is open university. Again, this has been very successful in developing countries. These have no or very low fees, open access, no prior qualification. Anybody can take a course. or Just have to be willing to do it. These are often very large. I'll show you how large in a minute. They're all distanced using multiple media, usually print, still print mainly. Um, instructional design, the courses are very well designed up front. Um, they have usually strong learner support in the form of part-time tutors who help the students through their courses. And of the students enrolled, they range from 15% completing a degree to 40%, depending on the institution. The Open University UK gets 40%. Um, Universitas Tabuca in Indonesia gets 15%. And these are where they are around the world. So there are 63 open universities worldwide. Uh, the first was in the UK, and it, it still today has 200,000 students, but it's in trouble because nearly all these open universities are government funded. And the British government has, been, has cut their grant completely, so their fees have gone up and their student enrollments have gone down as a result. The Indira Gandhi National Open University is the biggest. It's got 4 million uh, undergraduate and graduate students. Um, Open University China has, has 3.59 million students. Uh, m m the majority of them are what we would call grades 11 and 12, preparation for university students. But they still have 1.5 million undergraduate students. And Anadolu Open University of Turkey has 1.4 million students. None in the U USA, except maybe, well, we can make an argument maybe for Open SUNY, um, but it's not quite the same as an open university. You know, it's, it, it's a good project. I'm not criticizing it, but it's not. Um, you could make an argument for the University of Phoenix, but that's not quite the same as an open university, although it does actually meet, uh, serve a lot of the same demographics as, as say, the UK Open University does. Um, the first university to go fully online was the Open University of Catalonia in Barcelona, in Spain, in 1995. So what have we learned from these lessons in technology transfer? People say, well, everybody's got a mobile phone in Africa. Well, that might be true, but there's lots of problems. Less than 14% of uh, the population in Africa have internet access. This is last year's figures. It costs $2.00 to download a seven-minute YouTube video. That's a full-day salary for most people. Its main use of mobiles are text messaging and financial transactions. They don't use it much for, um, phone, for voice, mail, voice phone calls because it's too expensive. And to download one week is a week's wages. One MOOC is one week's wages for a 50-minute MOOC. So there are problems in assuming that because a new technology comes along, it can be used in developing countries. So the lessons are this, as follows. First of all, the projects that have worked have had sustainable local funding. Not money as grants from the US or from World Bank, but the governments have found the money themselves to fund the projects. So they have to be low cost in most cases, so low cost per unit certainly. Small steps, usually. They try something on a small scale, that ECO, the ICO project, you know, just started small and just expanded. You saw that with the University of North Carolina project. Uh, local adaptation and ownership. In other words, it's not something imposed on them from outside, but something that they feel they belong to and own and control. Affordable, reliable technology, wherever it happens to be. Local programming, and the last one, teacher training. Now, a lot of those early projects, they thought, technology will save us the money in, in teachers. We can get rid of the teachers. And they found they couldn't. 
They had to have the te somebody come in to switch the machine on, etc. Something, somebody to follow up with the students. Somebody had to assess the students. In the end, they found they had to have teachers anyway. And, and you need to train the teachers in order to follow up with the use of the technology. Uh, it needs to be integrated within the system. And that requires good governance. And I'll, come, I'll say a little bit more about good governance. It doesn't have to be a democracy. But it has to be a country that is not falling apart because it's of corruption and so on. In Afghanistan, we were trying to get an educational radio network up because that was what would work. We didn't want to put television in. In one day, we, we spent three months trying to get in to see the Minister of Communication. One day, the Japanese turned up, with the uh, Japanese ambassador turned up with the guy from a Japanese uh, company, and they sold him a complete news studio, TV news studio, so the president could broadcast to the people. Right? Uh, but it only reached Kabul. Um, it didn't reach the rest of the province. It helped nobody in the education side. And two years later, the Soviet Union invaded and took over the TV network to broadcast Russian propaganda. So... You know, you've got to have good governance as a, as a, as a basis. The second, and, and the other thing is security. The first thing the Indians found when they put uh, satellite TVs, uh, put TVs in for the satellite broadcast is that, first of all, the, the head man in the village would keep the TV for themselves and not share it with the rest, um, or they get stolen, or they get cannibalized. They take the parts out of them. So again, you've got to have security and um, for, 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 for these systems technology to work. The second, of course, is you've got to have a reliable and extensive infrastructure. Electricity is critical. If you haven't got electricity, it's really hard to use digital technologies. Um, and also, and this is less understood, you've got to have associated pedagogy and goals. In other words, the pedagogy and goals must meet the needs of the country. It can't be something you just import. One, one reason I think... Uh, one laptop per child has not been successful is because they didn't really look at this aspect, the associated pedagogy and the goals, and particularly adapting them to local use and, of course, train teachers and instructors. So you get a pyramid, basically. If you don't get good governance, everything else fails, even if you have all the rest. Then you've got to put the infrastructure in. You've got to allow the right pedagogy and understand the cultural implications, and you have to make sure there's local ownership. You have to train the teachers and then you can apply the technologies last. And what, what often happens with the developing country projects is that pyramid gets inverted. They start with the technology, then try to fix all the problems all the way up. So what do we know about digital learning now then? Well, the first thing we know is that a new technology is always overhyped. You probably know this Gartner hype cycle where... There's a technology trigger, and the media gets hold of it. You get a peak of inflated expectations. Then people start using it, and you get a trough of disillusionment. And then people realize, well, it does have some useful things, you know, and you get a slope of enlightenment as we work out what the strengths and weaknesses of it, and then we get a plateau of productivity. And it's quite hard to do that with learning technology. This is my interpretation. Uh, we'll start at learning analytics and artificial intelligence. They're getting, um, still getting boosted. Virtual reality is the big thing at the moment, or augmented reality. MOOCs have come down the slope, but they will come up again when people realize, yes, there are good things we can do with them. OER are just beginning to come up. Videos making a big recovery, actually. And learning management systems, they've been up there. And so we got online for credit courses. Now, the point here is though that this plateau of productivity is not always at the same level. So for MOOCs, it's likely to be lower, and I don't know, video might go higher than LMS, but, but nevertheless, it, it won't be taken off in the future like, like, like it. So the second thing that we now know is that digital learning is going to be the, not the exception. It's not, it's not an interesting thing off side now is going to become more and more central to, to teaching and learning. Um, I've got a typo there. That should be more than 30%, not less than 30% of all. I was very bad at math, so I never got the symbols right. More than 30% of all higher education students in the USA are taking at least one fully online course for credit. 
And now most students are already spending 50% or more of their study time online. Went home to see my grandson in England. Just started university doing physics at Manchester. Very traditional. Labs, lectures. And he's sitting at home and he's on the computer and I say, you're not doing your homework? And then he says, yes, I am. I said, what do you mean you're doing your homework? He says, well, you know, our textbook comes and we have all these exercises and activities to do. We do them online. And I, I said, well, how much time do you spend doing that? He says, oh, nearly all my studies doing this. You know, the lectures, I just try and have what I have to learn. And then I spend all my time online learning it. Now, if I went to his professor and said, hey, you're, you've got a blended learning course there, or a hybrid learning course, he would, he would say, no, I'm not. I'm not using te technology at all. So the, so the fact, you know, the, the, now what this means for an instructor, and this is a question every instructor has to ask now, is there's a continuum of technology, from no use of technology at all, to classroom aids like this, to flipped, to redesigned hybrid, to fully online. So the question is, where should my course be on that continuum? Well, that's what I thought the question was. And I've looked, thought more about it, it's not that. Which of my students should be on that continuum? And can I design for all my students? That's a different kind of question, and I think a more important question, because it's really not the faculty member that should decide whether it's appropriate or online. It's going to be the student. The student's working full-time, and they're trying to fit it in the evenings. They're going to want it fully online. If they come out of high school and they're paying lots of fees and want to meet girls and so on, they want to be on campus, right? Um, and if they're um, a full-time student but working um, in, in a hamburger joint, then literally a flip course, right? So, so it's the students really who should be deciding which is the appropriate mode. Now, here's the question for you instructional designers in the room. Can we design courses that could be a mix of uh, the same course, but the student could take it any way they liked? Now, I, the big thing, big problem for, for me is that I think that 90%, 95% of our faculty and our instructors in universities and colleges are totally unprepared for a digital learning world. Um, I won't go into all the reasons, that's another lecture. But the two fundamental questions that everyone of them has to ask now is what is best done face to face and what is best done online since we can do both and how do we make that decision? And how many of the instructional designers in this room could honestly put up their hand and say, we've got the research evidence to answer that question? I don't think we do have that. We don't have the theory or the research to answer that question effectively. And when and how to use technology for teaching? When should I use video? When should I ask students to read something? Uh, when should I stand in front of them and talk to them? What are our decision models or what are the faculty's decision models for, for, for giving a good answer that would be effective educationally. So I'm suggesting first we need to rethink the way we teach, particularly in post-secondary education. Knowledge is out there. What, think of the lecture. What is a lecture? Well, what I've done is I've done the research, I've collected it all together, I've put it in the form of an argument, and I've presented it to you. Right? But shouldn't the students be doing that? Shouldn't we be asking our students to go and find the knowledge that's out there already and organize it, decide what's important and what's not important, given the criteria and tools to do that, by all means? So it's a different role for a faculty member, because up to now, a faculty member is a content expert. I know this content better than anybody, and they do. And often they can teach it very well. You've got to know the content to teach it well. But on the other hand, it shouldn't be delivery of content now, that's our concern. Our concern should be the development of 21st century skills. Critical thinking, knowledge management, knowledge management particularly, independent learning, and so on. And of course, this is what online tech learning does really well. It forces the students to become independent thinkers. It forces them to go and find information, and so on. The other big challenge we have is the diversity of students. Now, it's less of a problem in the US, but in the UK, for instance, until very recently, only 8%, 10% of the high school population went on to university. They were all very bright students. They were deliberately selected. But now, that's, that's completely changed. We have a very wide range of students with different backgrounds, different knowledge, 
We have students in interdisciplinary courses who come with different levels of knowledge. So we need to find a way to individualize the teaching to help that range of students you've got in your class. And I don't mean AI type, you know, if you can do this, go over to there. But, I, you know, this student really needs a lot more effort put into basic uh, literacy skills, you know. And this one over here is really ready to go, but needs to do this. Um, technology literacy, obviously. Uh, teaching our students uh, how to use social media, how to identify proper sources, etc., when, when everything is available on the internet. Um, and so this means to me that faculty should really be try to reconsider their role as learning consultants for students, advising students on how to study what's worth, what's really important to learn, what the criteria are for assessing um, knowledge and so on. And I won't go into the reasons why I don't think they're ready to do that, but it's basically to do that the PhD is a good training in research, but it doesn't teach you anything about teaching. And you need pedagogy to answer, good understanding of pedagogy to answer those questions. So in conclusion, the digital economy requires high-level intellectual skills. The teaching methods must include opportunities for skills development. And that's another whole lecture, how you do that. The technology does enable more flexible delivery and ways to practice skills, as my grandson was finding doing problems online over and over again in physics. But all that's got to be within a specifically designed learning environment that supports students. So that's the challenge. So digital learning is not just a challenge for developing countries. It's a challenge for us. Um, master digital learning will be the new masters of the universe. And I don't make that statement lightly because if you can produce 21st century thinkers and um, this is where the high wages are. This is where the growth development is going to be. This is where the jobs are going to be. This is an economic argument, economic development argument, as well as an educational argument. And universities should be the best places to do this. That's what they're there for. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony, uh, for that uh, stimulating uh, Thought. I've got a couple questions, and I'm going to uh, go to our community here and ask as well for questions from the from the group. Remember, as we did back in the room, when you have a question, let me know. We'll get a microphone to you so we can get it because we have guests online as well. Patty's got mics. So my my question, I've I've got two, but I want to start off with this one. Have you seen through your um, in the U.S. a lot of what drives the online learning initiative? is the desire for a new economic engine. Right? We, we see potentially new enrollments, new revenue, and so forth. Are those drivers the same when you're looking at developing countries? Or if not, what are their drivers? What is causing them to, to go after the digital market? In the past, it's been access. I mean, very low proportion of students go on to higher education in Africa. Uh, it's very expensive if they do, so it's the elite. Um, that go on to university and so on. So it's been access mainly. It's the only way they can get access to education. Um, I, I think that... I didn't talk about universities' international education, about delivering your programs internationally, mainly because I wanted to focus on you know, the mis you know, what we've learned that works and what doesn't. And so it's very difficult to take, no, no matter even if you design it for a, uh, so it can be used internationally, an online course developed in the US and then convince somebody in Tanzania that this is relevant to them because all the examples will be from the US, etc., etc. So you, you really got to do a major redesign effort if you're going internationally. And a lot of universities don't want international online courses because they're worried it will take away the students who pay the big fees to come on campus. But it's a different audience. It's much lower cost for the students to take an online course. The students who come on campus will come on campus anyway because their their fathers and mothers want them to come to the US and make all the connections and so on and can afford not the fees but the high cost of living in the US. Now, so you're going to get a different demographic if you deliver online programs, but it's got to be designed for that demographic. It can't just be take off the shelf online courses and make them available internationally. 
if, if I can, before I go to the group, this uh, stimulated a, a second question I had, which was you, you referenced the idea about pedagogy, and the pedagogy um, in one environment in one culture may be different. Are you aware of research that tells us the kind of techniques or methodologies that work in one place? And have you seen that as well? Um, not, not so much. I, w I wouldn't say there are national pedagogies. I mean, many of the pedagogies are, in fact, imposed on them by colonialism. So it's the same pedagogies we had in the 1930s in the US and Britain and so on. It's still being, you'll find that still operating in developing countries. So a lot of emphasis on rote learning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have the problem in Canada, or not a problem, a real challenge in Canada with First Nations because their way of learning is very different from the dominant society. And we begin to learn from them about different ways of expressing knowledge and, and so on. So even within one's country, there are different ways of knowing and ways of learning. And I think what we tend to be is very arrogant and taken a kind of Western model of uh, 19th, 18th century enlightenment model, which is very good because it's rational, it's led to all the developments that have happened, but still there are other forms of pedagogy that might be worth exploring in particular contexts. So I'm very interested in how you design online learning for Aboriginal, Aboriginal communities. So can you bring in Aboriginal design, which is fantastic on the West Coast, I mean, amazing art and so on, can, can, can we bring that into the design of our online courses? And can we build interactions online that suit an Aboriginal way of knowing and so on without losing what they want is, you know, they want the qualification to be able to work in a um, dominant society and so on, but respect their culture at the same time. So I don't think it's just an international problem. I think it's an internal problem as well. And, and um, in so many other situations as well, when, when we dominate one culture, whatever it might be, we can lose those nuances of the, yeah. uh, of, and I, I love the idea of capturing those and embedding those back into, because we'll all gain from that, from yeah. that process. Thank you. Any questions from the, from the group? Audiences, Jack, I'm going to try to get over to you there or hand you them. I'll tell you what, if you, repeat, if you say it, I'll repeat it for the online audience. Could you repeat that? Do you want me to try? Yeah, would you repeat it for the Sure. For the so the question uh, that Jack asked us is, is, what are the technologies that we can use to drive students to higher order thinking, creativity, innovation, and how do we capture those and build those into our, our pedagogical models? Yeah, I'm not so sure it's the technology that limits you. It's the pedagogy that limits you. Um, and, you know, some pedagogies transfer better to some technologies than others, you know, but generally, for instance, uh, when I started writing my book, I did, I, I, my original intention was to talk about uh, design for online learning and design for classroom teaching. And then I realized you, you could, you know, and I took pedagogy as, as the dominant thing, and I found the pedagogies work both in class and online. You can have discussion groups online, you can have them in class, you can have, um, um, you, you can do an, have an apprentices, apprenticeship model which works uh, both in class and online, but you have to design it differently online for it to work. And I think you can do that with creative thinking and so on. It's the pedagogy rather than the technology. Now, within that, there are technologies that might be better for certain kinds of creative thinking than others. So I, I just had an experiment with virtual reality recently. It's uh, called Google Blocks. And what it does, it gives you um, a set of three-dimensional blocks and then it gives you two paddles and you can actually go in and stretch or color the blocks. You can move them around. And it's being used at the moment for um, prototype design of new cars um, and so on. So, yes, the technology can be there to enable you to do creative things you can try and explore and, and so on a lot more cheaply than you can with models in, 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 in a lab, for instance. But again, it's the pedagogy. What, how do you want somebody to learn design? And is there technology around that will enable you? The thing that technology normally does is to scale. In other words, what you can do on your own, technology often allows you to scale up for a lot more when you're not actually there yourself. So that's, that's what I would look for technology to do. Can it scale the way I want to teach? 
can it, again, like my grandson, give them more practice, lots more practice, to developing a skill of problem solving in math, for instance, or physics. Gamification. So if you consider gamification as a methodology or technology, gamification using game oh, gamification, technology. Gamification, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yes. Uh, the problem with gam gamification is the cost. It costs a lot of money to develop a game. And a lot of the things that we want to use in education are just, we don't have the size of market to make it worthwhile putting in the investment to do it well. Now we can do games cheaply, but then the students say, you know, look at these graphics, they're terrible. You know, when you come from the world of, you know, whatever it is. Um, <laughs> so, so you've got to do it well. Now, University of Central Florida is doing a lot of research because they're based in Orlando and they've got Disney Animation Center there, the National Animation Center. So they're doing a lot of experimentation with games. Again, you have to wait for the cost to come down. What, what's happening now, you can get building blocks for games. In other words, you can get lots of scenery. You know, you don't have to design all the scenery yourself. You just download the software and it's almost free, it's cheap. But then you still have to build the game within that scenery. And that's like doing a movie. You have to have a script, uh, you, you have to have a storyline, and et cetera. Uh, you have to have alternative outcomes. So you still got to build all that in. And, and that's expensive. Now, if you could scale that up, if you wanted to use a game, for instance, for teaching basic uh, chemical reactions, for instance, and how to, how to do that, then it might be worthwhile doing if it would sell to every university you know, in, in, in the States. But you've got to have scale with, 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 with those kinds of things. When I've been going around looking at innovation in Canadian universities, it's very low tech. Use of mobile phones, uh, e-portfolios, um, using the learning management system, do, using talking circles from First Nations in, uh, in a learning management system and so on, because of the cost. You just cannot afford to have high cost original development. Um, and so you're looking at technologies that are easy to, for students and faculty to use. Okay, thank you. Other questions? So this continues to come up as a question in strategic planning at my university is, uh, you know, you talked about the future of um, online learning being open resources and free content. And I was curious as to kind of your insights on the net neutrality debate and how that kind of brings that Sorry, to the question. The, debate? the net neutrality debate? Net neutrality, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'm a net neutral person, you know. I'm, I, I, I don't think that the big companies should be able to determine, you know, what should be paid for at different rates. Um, uh, so, I mean, it's a, it's a complicated question, and I have a very simple answer. You know, it shouldn't be deregulated. It should be regulated. That it, it's neutral. Everybody should pay the same price for the whatever. You know, you have, you pay for fast download speeds if it's a lot, and you pay for slow download speeds if it's a little. I don't have a problem with that. But charging people to use uh, Netflix more than using you know, MOOCs, for instance, doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. I, mean, I don't think that answers your question. Yeah, I, think it's more I think my question is, if, if things swing the, direct, the opposite direction, how do we as online learning providers deal with that potential threat? Yeah, I don't know. Um, move to Canada. <laughs> 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 That's been suggested in the last several months. Let's <laughs> let's not go there. <laughs> I, I, I have to tell you seriously, we are Canada is looking very carefully at what's happening in the U.S. Um, we had a big influx of international students. We're getting a lot of uh, what we call um, third third party immigrants. In other words, immigrants who've gone to the U.S. but whose status is not clear. Um, trying to come in illegally because if they come in legally they're not allowed because the US is considered a safe country. But if that status changes then we're in trouble because the borders will open and, and so on. And so, so we're looking at other things we can gain by um, restricting certain access like free trade and so on. You know, we'll go and trade somewhere else. So 
your, your price of your houses will go up because you'll be paying more for lumber because your lumber industry has tried to put in tariffs, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, you, we are a foreign country. I mean, we might look the same, we may speak the same, but we're a different country. And there are some serious issues here because it's so easy to do things in Canada um, rather than the States. And you have to look at that. Net neutrality could have much greater significance than, than just what it does to the American market. Because if we can't get uh, equal access, say, to uh, Netflix or to Google, then we will set up our own alternative systems. And that traffic will then be lost to the US. So there, there, there's a, always a negative side to these things. But I don't want to get into politics here. Good question. Um, we, there, there is a lot of development of online learning. It depends what you call a developing country, because that goes a very, very wide spectrum. I was talking about least developed countries in my talk. But if you go to Mexico, for instance, if you consider that a developing country, which I'm not sure it is now, um, they have a lot of online learning, a lot of activities going on there. They have uh, some several very good universities offering very high quality online programs. But they are taken mainly by the top 30% of income group in, in, in Mexico. Mainly because the bottom 30% don't have internet access. So even in a country like Mexico, you've got this divide, digital divide if you like. And again, if, um, you can design very good online programs in developing countries, but you've got to make sure that you can deliver to the audiences you're trying to get to. Um, and that, that's a big problem in many, many countries. Um, there are still parts of Canada where we don't have good internet access in the far north, for instance. And it's very hard. Then we, if you're just doing a survey, the three colleges that cover the Arctic, none of them offer online courses because they can't deliver them outside their own towns. Um, so, you know, infrastructure always is the critical factor here. Uh, why would they develop them themselves rather than take them from um, Stanford and so on? Well, it'd be all right if Stanford gave qualifications for the courses, but they don't. It's a con, isn't it? You know, you take our courses, but we won't accept you into our university, even if you're successful on the course. So until there's um, open accreditation. Now, I had a very interesting phone call um, when I was in Quebec. I was driving in the snow and I trying to remember. It was from Idaho and it was from oh, Brigham Young University. Yeah. And they are looking to develop online courses uh, in developing countries. Right? Um, and I was asked by the reporter, what did I think of it? And I said, that's great. If they offer the online courses into a developing country, the students qualify and if the qualification allows them to come and work in the US. Otherwise, why would they take them? It's a con if you offer the courses and then you don't follow up with the, uh, with the economic opportunities that um, the students have taken the courses for. So you have to be, you know, this is why you have to look very carefully at where your policy is going at the moment in the US. Because it, to me, you're going to cut off a huge international market. I think there's a huge market if you're willing to accept students the, the, the ideal way is to do the first two years online and then come to the university for the last two years. Then they get the benefit of both, for instance. Um, so why would they develop them locally? Well, because it might give them local jobs. That's the reason. Because they won't get a qualification under the current circumstances from the US unless they're admitted to the university and have all the privileges of a student admitted to the university, which you don't get with MOOCs, for instance. Thank you. I think that was from uh, Ray Ann Fayed, American University of Beirut, who was in IELOL last, uh, last year. So thank you, Ray Ann, for that question. Uh, any others, Haley, on your end? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, often I'm fi we're finding that students coming from high school, if they haven't done an online course in high school, often uh, are not happy to do an online course when they come to university. Uh, in BC, we have pretty good online program for uh, grades 11 and 12. So, in fact, some school boards now require students to do at least one course on, online um, so that they're prepared for this. Um, so it, it comes down to the school policies to some extent, to the school boards, 
and what they're doing. Now, I, I, this is an area which I, don't, I, I deliberately don't look at what's happening in K-12 in the US because it's such a big area and I, I don't know. But I know you've got charter schools, for instance, and online charter schools particularly. So again, there are other issues around that which are not to do with so much with whether it's online, but whether it should be public or private and so on. So I don't want to get into that. But I, I think most schools should be um, introducing some form of online learning in the later years of school. Um, not maybe replacing the whole uh, subject curriculum, but maybe having some of the study done online uh, so they get used to it. So when they come to university, they know. I, I think more importantly is that they should get experience of digital learning in the school system. Uh, and in fact, I think some of the schools are doing that very well. You, you know, they're using iPads, for instance, in elementary schools now. Uh, so students will come with a range of different skills. That, that's the problem. It goes back to that diversification. When you get the students in university, some will have a high level of digital uh, technology skills and some will have very low levels. And, and it's not just the use of technology, it's their literacy as well, which is their digital literacy about how questioning they are of the sources they get and so on. UBC has a very good program called Digital Tattoo. Um, this is developed by the library for students and it shows the, stu it shows the students their, the trace they leave on the internet with their activities. So they can plug this app in and they can put in their, their Facebook, their Twitter, their Instagram stuff and it will show them wh what happens to all that and who gets that information and what they do with it. You know, I, I think we need programs like that in universities and so on. Um, to, to make students aware of their digital trace on the internet. And I think I should do it too, because I'd probably be terrified if I did that. <laughs> Good, thank you. Other questions? Comments? So, so Tony, I want to thank you on behalf of uh, our program, ILOL. Thank you for sharing with us. We look forward to tomorrow for you and Ednan to join us. Ednan, uh, uh, we'll introduce it more formally tomorrow. Uh, thank you to our uh, online guests as well for joining us uh, this afternoon, and um, thank you for launching our first EdTech Network Fisher Talk. Thank you, family. Thank you.